Hello again, fight fans, and welcome to episode 294 of the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast. I am your host for Ring Magazine, RingTV.com, and the Ring Digital YouTube channel. As always, I remind you, make sure that you're subscribed, click that little notification bell, and make sure you subscribe to my platforms, Montero on Boxing, on all social media uh, apps and all that good stuff. And of course, on YouTube, I have a personal YouTube channel. I do a wrap-up show most Fridays. And then I do an impromptu rant video here and there. We'll probably do a couple of those over the last couple of weeks of the year when things slow down. So make sure you're subscribed over there as well. All right, guys. I should note that uh, next Monday will be episode 295 of TNC, and that will be the last episode for 2021. I was going to do shows all the way through New Year's. But of course, the the end of year shows, you know, they've they've been postponed. So there's really no point to doing TNC after next Monday. So I just want to put that little programming note in your mind. So next Monday will be the last show of the year. But again, I will continue to put out material on ringtv.com and of course over on my uh, personal YouTube channel. So check that out. And I'll continue to troll and have some fun on Twitter. We had lots of fun this weekend. And you know, I've just decided, man. You, you got to have fun with some of these guys uh, on Twitter. Uh, there's just a lot of, I'm just going to, there's just a lot of dummies. There's just a lot of dummies that just, be, just buy into propaganda and, and they're, you know, you could do five minutes of research and, and start to learn about interim titles and gold and silver and super champs or regular champs. And you could try to educate yourself on the propaganda and all that, or you could just buy into it and be a moron. Well, there's a lot of morons out there, and I've just decided I'm going to stop interacting and trying to reach them. I'm just going to troll the fuck out of them. So I've been having some fun, and um, we're going to continue that. So I had some fun, and by the way, that includes sometimes the the networks and and the promoters and all that. You know, I had a lot of fun this weekend with the Nico Ali Walsh thing, Muhammad Ali's grandson. In case you haven't heard. And I, I get it. Some of you guys are like, Mike, we get it. You're beating a dead horse. <laughs> hey, man, I was just having some fun. And I know you guys had some fun, too. I, I couldn't play the drinking game with you because I was working. By the way, I want to give a quick shout out to Money Powell III, who I, I called the fights with, uh, Daniel Jackman over at um, Vive TV, everybody at the WBC channel. Uh, that was a lot of fun doing a live stream of the Underground Showdown show here in Atlanta. Terry the Boss Moss, who's awesome put on that show along with uh, Tina, Lisa, just all, all the, the whole crew at Buckhead Fight Club had an awesome time, really, really great time doing that show. And, um, you know, got home, uh, really couldn't watch the fights until the next morning, and I watched all the fights. That's what's cool about the apps, man. I was able to catch all the fights uh, Sunday morning and, you know, just enjoyed my Sunday morning coffee and watched all the fights. And it was, it was all good, man. So I got to, you know, I had a gig this weekend. I worked. I had a great time, worked with wonder, wonderful people. And then um, Sunday, caught up in on my boxing, got some trolling in on Twitter. It was just a good weekend, man. A really good weekend of fights. A lot of stuff was going on, a lot of good action. And this weekend, there's a ton of fights. Uh, there was last weekend, too. I think, I don't quote me on this, <clears throat> don't quote me on this number, guys, but I want to say it was 58 cards uh, on Saturday alone. Last weekend, 58 cards. I know it was at least 50. So when you have that many cards going on, uh, it did affect, I think, the attendance for pretty much every show. But it then also, you know, there's so many sports right now. Winter sports are in f full swing, right? Uh, you're right in the middle of the season for most of these uh, winter sports. And um, that affects things too. But there is so much quality content out there that uh, I just think for sports fans and fight fans in general, it was a great weekend. I know it was for me. So anyway, just wanted to give a shout out to everybody that worked on that show with with uh, with me Saturday night. It was a lot of fun. And as I've said before, I think Terry Moss is building something here in Atlanta. This is a growing market in a growing fight market. And, you know, I'm proud that I've had a little something to do with that, but just a little bit. And that I'm, I feel like I'm kind of in on the ground floor or something that we're building. And that was part of why ultimately I chose to move here. There was a few different cities when my wife and I decided we wanted to leave Los Angeles. Uh, there was a few different cities that we targeted. 
And I, I looked at Atlanta specifically, and I was like, you know, there's some real opportunities to build something there. And there's really not many, quote unquote, boxing people there. I can be one of the few and we can build something together with the, the other, the, the, the OGs in this area, which Terry Moss is one of them. And um, we're doing it, man. We're doing it. So really, really cool stuff. And the stream on the WBC live channel is getting, getting better each time. It's a process. And um, there's the production team on this end, you know, physically at the site. And then there's the digital production team, like behind the scenes. And, you know, you have a lot of people working together, a lot of moving parts there's been some hiccups and some bumps okay a few of you guys that have caught those streams that we've been doing um you you've you know you've given me some great feedback and i'm going to share that with those guys uh but each one's getting better each each show that we do it, it, it's getting more seamless so uh, again we're building something all right so um phone lines are open i, I know that you guys are going to have a lot that you want to discuss but i've got a ton of stuff to review and preview. So let me get through that, okay? And then we'll get calls, of course, on the back end of the show. So sit tight and listen to me rant <laughs> and uh, get, get it going in the comment section. By the way, punch that thumbs up, man. Punch that thumbs up. 16 of you so far have given me a thumbs up. Come on, what the fuck? There's a lot more of you watching. Go ahead and hit the thumbs up. Oh, right away, Chris Bergen, my man, my friend Chris with the super chat. Thank you so much, man. He said, in the Tio Cambosos fight, why did two judges score round one 10-9? Because they're stupid, Chris. Because they're stupid. I, I, you know, I think their justification was that Tio dominated that round, I guess, until the knockdown. I didn't necessarily see that. But in boxing, if you score a knockdown, it's supposed to be a 10-8 round unless the other fighter comes, is my understanding, unless the other fighter comes back from that knockdown and thoroughly dominates the rest of the round after the knockdown. And, of course, that's certainly not what happened there. An instance of this would be, I want to say, uh, the Joshua Klitschko fight. Because, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, guys, because I might be getting my rounds mixed up. There was the fourth or fifth round. I think AJ dropped Vlad. And Vlad came back and dominated the rest of that round. Or here's another example. Um, the first fight between Fury and Wilder. You know, after Fury got up from that knockdown, he absolutely beat the shit out of Wilder for the rest of that round. So so those would be examples. Now, I would still score those 10-8 rounds. But I think in some judges' minds, those are examples where you could maybe go 10-9. But that first round between Tio and, and Cambosos, I don't think that counts. Um, I 10-8 round, man, if there's a knockdown, as, as far as I'm concerned. All right, let's get into this review, man. We got a ton of stuff to, to talk about, guys. Just so much boxing right now. Everyone's trying to get in that last card of the year, you know, and there's um just a ton of shows from club level shows all the way up. And uh, it's not just here in the States. It's all over. So last Saturday, December 11th, um, man, I, I just hit on a few things. Dimitri Bivol defended his light heavyweight title in a pretty uninspired performance. Sonny Edwards defended his flyweight title. I think that was uh, – Bevel's fight was in Russia, and Edwards' fight was in uh, Dubai. Donnie Nieta has also fight, fought in Dubai. Got a draw in a fight that he was heavily favored to win. John Rael Casimero withdrew from the fight. Du he was supposed to fight in that Dubai card, but he withdrew, um, and he might be stripped of his title, his Bantamweight title due to weight issues. Now, apparently he was in the hospital and got checked out. And everything's okay now, but apparently there was major dehydration. He wound up having to go to the hospital to get fluids. And get, this is all kind of rumors and speculation. Nobody has officially reported on it, but these are some of the things I've been told from some of the people I know close to the situation. John Rail Casimero really fucked up what could have been a pretty good year for him. Uh, he was in line to fight Nonito Donaire, and due to some of the things he and some people on his team said, screwed themselves out of that fight with Donaire. Um, and now this happens. Uh, they, they really, really, really screwed up that year, man. That, that's another, you just look at the way certain careers are managed and the decisions people make. And some of the decisions that have been made over there, not very good. And it, it just look at where Casamero's 2021 started and how it's ending. Oof. Tough, tough, tough. Okay, uh, Echo Arena, Liverpool, England, matchroom on the zone. Connor Ben, KO4 win over Chris Algieri in a welterweight fight. So I tweeted about this um, on Sunday. 
Connor Ben, there's there is something there. Now th there are some people on boxing Twitter and everything else saying, "Oh my God, Connor Ben's ready for Errol Spence. He's ready for Terence Crawford. He's an elite welterweight." Okay, all of you, slow down. All right, he had a very good 2021. For you look back just three years ago, we thought Connor Ben was just going to be another. Oh, he's a son of a famous fighter, whatever. No, no, he's he's improved, okay? And this year, he had three good wins over Sam Vargas, Adrian Granados, Chris Algieri. None of those guys were in their prime. None of those guys were ever elite pound-for-pound -pound level guys. But they are experienced. They are veterans. And some of the, they have some good wins between them, okay? They're, they're quality, knowledgeable, experienced prize fighters. So for a prospect, which is what I consider Ben to be, I don't care how many fights he has. I still can kind of consider him. He's graduated from prospect to like junior contender, baby contender with these wins. But in 2022, it's time to start fighting guys who are in their physical prime, guys who can punch, guys who are true welterweights. Let's see how he does against them. But right now, I have to admit, I'm impressed. I like what I see. I see definite improvement. And I want to see where he can go from here. So he's got my attention. And I'm going to be paying attention from now on. Had a good 2021. Rose the, the game a little bit. Rose the stakes. Okay, now let's raise the stakes a little bit higher next year. In the co-main, Katie Taylor improves to 20-0 with a unanimous decision win over Firuza Sharapova. Defends her undisputed lightweight championship. And look, it's, there are some people out there just hate Katie Taylor. I saw this on boxing Twitter as well. Um, and if you don't have Clarissa Shields rated pound for pound number one, you're a hater at best. At worst, you're one of the ISTs. Um, I, I don't understand how anybody can look at women's boxing objectively and not recognize that Katie Taylor has the best resume in women's boxing. If you look at the fighters she has fought now, I do think that that first win over Delphine Pearson in 2019, that majority decision win, that was controversial. You, you, that fight could have went either way. And if you scored it for Pearson, I ain't mad at you. I thought the rematch was a clear win for Katie Taylor. She left no doubts. So she showed improvement and she showed, you know, uh, extra heights that, that or depth to her game that maybe we hadn't seen yet. Okay. She showed that there is a little something extra there. But just the names. It's pretty clear that it's between Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano. Really, those to me, th those two women have the best resumes in the sport, just in terms of the names they have fought. All right. In terms of the hardware, if that's what you glorify as the hardware, yes, it's Clarissa Shields. But as I always tell you guys, the belts are political, it's all politics. And there's business behind the business. And I've I've done the math and I've Gone over the numbers on the show a million times. I'm not going to do it again here. The depth of talent where Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano are fighting, and even Jessica McCaskill, for that matter, because she's getting close to being in that conversation now. It, the, the talent there is just, it's deeper. The talent pool is deeper than where Clarissa fought. So it's not hating. It's just rec it's real recognizing real, okay? Now, Katie didn't look fantastic in this fight, and there have been a few fights where she's struggled. Uh, they've been highly competitive, but all in all, she's got the best resume in all of women's boxing. I still, in 2022, I want to see her and Amanda Serrano, who has a fight she has to win this weekend, and I think she will. I want to see the two of them fight. And the two of them, when they fight, the winner of that fight is the, in my opinion, undisputed queen of women's boxing, pound for pound. And that will just end the debate, and I don't want to hear any other names at that point. All right, let's come over here to the United States and look at the two shows. Uh, we'll start in California. Dignity Health Sports Park, Carson, California. TGB Promotions, PBC on Showtime. Let's talk about the undercard. Brandon Lee, friend to the show. KO7 win on the undercard continues to be a prospect that we're keeping an eye on. Has explosiveness. Got a little twitch to him. Um, good stock, half Korean, half Mexican. So there's you know, plenty of boxing stock there. Um, Grew up boxing, right? But we don't know if he can catch. We don't know if he can make adjustments. We haven't seen him in there against a guy that's going to force him to dig down, bite down a little bit on the mouthpiece and show us something. Until we see that, we don't know. But 
so far passes the eye test. Upset special on this undercard. Cody Crowley scores a unanimous decision win over Kujra Tio Abdu Kukarov. One of my favorite names to say in boxing right now. Abdu Kukarov. That's just fun to say. But um, Abdu Kukarov was supposed to win this fight, okay? Just between me and you. He was supposed to win. He was the A side here, and they were building him up. Who's Becky fighter? I think he came into this 10 and 0. Solid resume so far for a fighter with 10, you know, a fighter with 10 fights. And he was supposed to win. But not only did he lose this fight, he lost it pretty clearly. It's not as if this was close or controversial. Crowley decisively won this fight. So this was an upset, man. And at ring, uh, we took Abdul Kukarov. It's not like a major upset, but I'm saying it's a minor upset. We took him out of the top 10 ratings uh, in, the, in the division, and we added Crowley after this. And I thought that was just. And the main event, Nonito Donaire, who is going on 40 years old. He's 39 right now. Scores a KO4 win over Raymart Gabayo, who came into this fight undefeated from the Philippines, 25 years old, but didn't have the resume. Donaire showed the levels, and uh, I think it was a body shot that that really did damage defense's WBC bantamweight belt. Had a good year. Donaire with that KO4 win over uh, Nordin Ubali to grab that title, who I think was, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I think Ubali was undefeated. And then beats Gabayo, who wasn't, you know, rated as highly as uh, as Ubali, but still, uh, two good wins. And he was supposed to and was willing to fight uh, Casimero, but all that fell apart. Uh, and you know, a lot of people are blaming Donaire for not wanting that fight and avoiding it and all this. I totally side with the Donaire people on that whole thing. I, I think it was a complete epic clusterfuck on the Casimero side. I was pretty close to that situation the, the whole way because I was talking to everybody involved. And again, you look at what's happened with both fighters since those neg negotiations fell apart. Look what just happened with Casimero. Look what Donaire just did. Yeah, that kind of tells you everything you need to know. It's hard not to be a fan of Nonito Donaire. And he, again, I, I will continue to say this. First ballot Hall of Famer, first chance I get to vote for him, he's got it. He's just that guy. And what the cool thing is for a little fighter, okay, to have this resurgence at the toward the end of his career, like he's having, and he's not beating all time greats, right? He's okay. I don't want to overstate his wins, but they are impressive when you consider that he's an older guy in the lower divisions where uh, those fighters age quicker. And we know he's clean. We know Donito Donaire is a clean fighter. So to be doing what he's doing in an era where so many guys are breaking the rules, all right, from the journeyman level guys, but especially the top level guys, because they can afford the drugs and, and all these things, right? They, they cheat a lot more than the journeyman, believe me, okay? Uh, but for Donaire to be doing this as a little guy toward the tail end of his career that we know is clean. So impressive. It's just hard not to be a, a, a big time. I'm just, I'm fanboying out right now because that's just badass stuff, man. And it should be respected. Okay, let's go to New York. Madison Square Garden, top rank on ESPN, where top rank announced the attendance as 8,555. And this was kind of a boxing show, kind of a 90th birthday party for Bob Arum. And Although the car dragged down way too long, and that's just what top rank shows do, and they really need to work on that. That's a big beef I have with them. This was fun. Tyson Fury comes out, and I don't know what he was on. Maybe he was just high on life because he does have that kind of personality. Maybe he shared some gummies with Grandpa Bob, but he had a little too much energy for gummies. I'm thinking something else. Maybe a little white girl. I don't know what it was. But Tyson was amped up. And he's saying happy birthday. I just like, he, he tells the crowd, he goes, I'm going to sing a song to Bob Arum. And it's called happy birthday. <laughs> no, we know what the happy birthday song is, Tyson. You don't, you could just start singing. Everyone knows how to jump right in on that. You don't have to announce that's the name of the song. Um, he seemed a little amped up on side. I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he was just hyped up. Anyway, it was fun. And here's what I appreciate, okay? And I trolled the living fuck out of top rank all week long with the Nico Walsh stuff. You guys saw that. I'm equal opportunity troll. I go, uh, the PBC guys, I let them have it. ESPN, Eddie Hearn, all of them. 
and I trolled the hell out of a Nico Walsh thing, okay? Just the way I used to with the Fury lineal thing. But I do appreciate this. They list the attendance at 8,555. There was no propaganda there. They don't feel the need to lie and say, okay, we sold 8,500 tickets. Let's give away 5,000. So we can get, you know, 13, 14,000 people in here and we can announce this as a sellout. We'll, we'll curtain off the top and we'll say it's a sellout. So everyone could hear, oh, Madison Square Garden sold out, right? There's just none of that propaganda. And it's not, oh, we're going on pay-per-view. We're a pay-per-view star. We're doing this. And we're, it's like, no, nah, no, nah, we 8,000 tickets. And let me tell you, as a boxing guy who actually understands this business and knows the business more than 99% of the motherfuckers doing this shit out there, um, to, to do 8,500 tickets, even let's say 500 of those are gimmies for family members and all that kind of shit. Okay. You're selling 8,000 tickets in the garden on a loaded weekend of sports. The Heisman thing was going on and, you know, football's in full swing, basketball, hockey, all this stuff, right? I mentioned earlier in the show, there were like 58 boxing cards alone on Saturday night. So it affected attendance everywhere. Even, even at our show in Atlanta, I mean, every show it affected the attendance because there's so much going on right now. The, the market's super saturated. So you have a guy from the Ukraine and a guy from Ghana, and they're 135 pounds soaking wet, and you do over 8,000 tickets. Hey, man, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. There's no need to try to sugarcoat that or exaggerate it. Just give the truth. And that's what they did. And I, I appreciate that, man. Stick to the truth. The truth will set you free. You don't have to exaggerate. All right? Because that's a good number. I'm not sitting there saying it's amazing. I'm not saying, oh, my God, I'm about, I got a fucking boner over here and my head's going to explode. It's a good number. It's respectable. 8,000 tickets for the, this level of show? Cool. Don't have to exaggerate it. All right. I beat that dead horse. On the undercard, Jared Anderson, walk to the ring. Heavy, I, should, I should say, undefeated American heavyweight Jared Anderson, walk to the ring in a pimp outfit. Some people were deeply offended by this. Some people found it to be awesome. I personally found it to be kind of awkward, awkwardly cringeworthily hilarious. I, I just didn't understand it. Pimps, pimp hoes, right? So were you calling your opponent a hoe? He didn't walk out to the ring with a bunch of women. He walked out with his entourage. I just don't understand the pimp thing. I, a, a boxer pimp? Yeah, I just don't get it. Just doesn't add up for me. I, I just thought it was really corny, but so corny that it was hilarious. I laughed my ass off. But anyway, an impressive win for Jared Anderson, who I think, again, Real deal. The thing about Jared Anderson compared to other recent American heavyweight standouts, he's not a project fighter, meaning he's not a guy from basketball or football or something that gets injured, blows out his knee, and they're like, oh, let's rehab him and get him in boxing gloves. No, no, no. This is a kid who grew up boxing. And so he has that natural fluidity about him in the ring. We just don't know if he can catch. If he can catch, watch out because there could be something there. But the pimp outfit thing, yeah. Find a different act, man. That just that just didn't work for me. That was corny as hell. Xander Zayas, KO1 win. He really needs to step up in 22. Great 2021. Do what you're supposed to do. Let's step up the opposition, because I probably could have beat the guy you fought. Nico Walsh got a gift majority decision. I'll just leave that alone as it is. And by the way, I should mention, I'm trolling when I troll the Ali grandson thing because ESPN mentions it every 42 seconds. Um, I'm not bashing the kid. I got nothing against the kid. He seems like a nice kid. Okay, good, good for him. You know, whatever. Milk it, man. Get, get your money. Do what you got to do. I'm just trolling ESPN and top rank, and you just you can't help it. Okay, it's just it's too much. It's too easy. So I want to make that clear. I got nothing against the, the kid himself, but it really, really looked like. This could have been a draw or a W for his opponent, and he was lucky to walk out of there with a majority decision win. And then the Davis brothers get stoppage wins. Keyshawn Davis, definitely one to keep an eye on. Okay, before I get into the preview, and there's a ton of fights this weekend, 
let's go here to the chat. And I just want to hit on some of your guys' comments and then um, we'll do the preview. Okay. Let me see. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Anything juicy here. Uh, do, 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 do. People listen like, come on, Mike, get to it. <laughs> yeah, you guys seem to agree with me going back to the Tiafima Lopez uh, round one against Cambosis that that you know, should have been a 10-8 round. I concur. We got D-Style Boxing in the chat. I see he's on here. Cool. couple of you guys saying that you want to see women's fights be three minute rounds. Yeah. We've been saying that forever. Yeah. Nacho says that Casimiro didn't even make weight Saturday. Uh, I wonder if he stays at 118. I don't think so. And I think the, I, what, is it the WBO he has? I can't remember which belt, but I think he's going to be stripped. And Nacho says, I need Donaire versus in two next year. I think we could get that man. Donaire really, really wants it. In career is kind of stalled because of all the lockdowns and restrictions in Japan, it's really affected his career this year. Um, I'd love to see that rematch. And Donaire went to Japan once. I'm sure he'd be willing to do it again. And this time around, what, it'd be a unification bout, right? So, um, yeah, let's see that. <laughs> Kouster says that Fury was partying with Oscar De La Hoya. I'm going to leave this one alone. I'm going to leave that one alone. Twal said, Usyk looked at Fury like his food. Oh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, so Usyk was there in the house at that top rank card. Everybody was there, and Fury was there. And Usyk looked, you know, he was being his typical self. He's kind of goofy and fun and stuff. He was making jokes, but he looked serious. He looked healthy. He looked sober. <laughs> I don't know about Fury. So um, as far as lifestyles, you, you could tell there's a difference there, right? But they did kind of embrace and, you know, give each other, you know, five and everything and shake hands and all that. And you could see the size difference. I mean, it's, it's, it's abundantly clear that Fury is way, way bigger of a man. So Usyk to say he'll have his work cut out for him against Fury. Of course, that's an understatement of the century. He's got to get past AJ first. That's not going to be as easy as some people say. Uh, or think, I think, you know, that's going to be a very, very competitive fight. And I do expect AJ to be better in the rematch. But with those two fight, I got to say, I'm probably going to favor Usyk. I know. I said I'd never bet against Fury again, but. Mm. <laughs> Mitch says, who is this Nico Walsh guy? He's someone's grandson. I don't know. Daniel Rio says, Donaire needs to be on the pound for pound list. You know, you bring up a good point. Um, although does beating Ubali and, uh, Gabayo rate pound for pound. I don't know about that. Now, overall body of work. Yeah. Having that close fight with in who obviously is top five right now, pound for pound. Okay. Now you might be on to something. It's definitely a discussion I'm open to having, uh, right now, because the, the, again, the top four or five, five fighters right now. Pound for pound. That's pretty easy. The names are all pretty clear. But after that, it really is kind of wide open. And Donaire might be one of those guys that could sneak in. Absolutely. <clears throat> Kouster says, Nico Walsh's dad looks like Michael Douglas. <laughs> That's hilarious. One out the front door says, uh, Tank versus Cruz under 100K. Yeah, let's talk about that, huh? Um, and I tweeted about this. Certain American media members, some senior members, right? You know the names that have kind of been on the dole for years and years um, and do the, well, I'll just say they do favors. I'll just leave it at that. Um, they couldn't wait to tweet out numbers for the Terrence Crawford, Sean Porter pay-per-view. I mean, it was literally, I think, Monday or Tuesday that one in particular uh, tweeted out numbers and, you know, I kind of responded and was like, you know, it's funny how quickly certain pay-per-view, how, you know, certain pay-per-views, the numbers come in so quickly, others take a week or two and their response was, well, it's on the app. So, you know, cause it was on the ESPN plus app. So you could get numbers from the app much quicker, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, doesn't, doesn't Showtime have an app? 
So Showtime pay-per-view, that would include the app, right? Shouldn't you have some trending data to report? Because, you know, with a lot of the PBC pay-per-views, what you see is certain media members will tweet out things like, the numbers aren't in yet, but it's trending at 500,000, whatever number, right? It's trending around this number. We think it'll come out here, right? And that will happen a few days after the pay-per-view because they can't wait to be the first one to tweet that. We didn't get any of that for Tank vs. Cruise. Now, I told you guys, and I didn't just say it on this show. I said it on a, another show I was on, the Hispanics Cause a Panic Roundtable show. I said it on there that that, that pay-per-view was going to tank. Don't believe me? Go back and watch that shit. And in fact, I, I said that it might be Gervonta Davis's last pay-per-view for a while because it's going to tank. The one good thing that could come from that pay-per-view tanking, no pun intended, is that it might force that team to realize, okay, even our gullible, ignorant fans are starting to catch up to what's going on here, and they're demanding better. So we have to raise the stakes a little bit and at least fight a top 10 guy or top, sorry, top five guy. Um, So maybe that'll happen. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Probably not. Okay. <clears throat> uh, here's a good one. Uh, one Foot says, uh, why does Floyd sound angrier than ever? I don't know. But you know what's funny is now Floyd has spun this narrative that the media is hating on Gervonta Davis because they don't like Floyd. So Floyd's made it about him. And what's so interesting, I bring this up because today I tweeted about the pay-per-view numbers. Like, hey, where are the numbers at? You know, and this kid, you know, respond. And I click on his profile. And it's a bunch of Floyd t- tweets, you know, and Deontay Wilder stuff. So you could just tell, you know, and he's got like a hundred followers. One of these guys, and he re- re- you know, quote retweets me and says, "Man, y'all hate Tank Davis just because he with Floyd." Like he just repeated what Floyd said, and it's just, it's crazy how. And this is what politicians do. I'm not going to get on a political rant. But you guys know I don't like politicians. They just say something that's not true. And they say it over and over and over and over. And their constituents, their lapdogs, just start to repeat it. They People don't ever question anything. I was raised to be skeptical of everything and everybody. Maybe it's the block I grew up on and the thing I grew up around. But I was raised to question everything. Trust nothing and always dig in because people, people talk bullshit, especially people in charge. That's what I was always told. Uh, so I always look in the shit, you know, and it's just, it's amazing to me that people will just repeat something. It's not just Floyd. Okay. Everyone does this, but Floyd's lackeys are particularly ignorant. Some of them. And they're kids. They're 20 years old. I get it. If you're a kid, kids, when I was 20, I was a moron. I'm still half a moron, right? So I get it. But man, there's grown men repeating this stuff. Grown men. And I'm like, dude, you have like kids and you you pay a mortgage and you're you're repeating this nonsense. It it hurts the brain to try to understand it. It it truly does. Okay, let's do this preview because there's a lot. Um, okay, Tuesday, December 14th, tomorrow in Japan, no, Naoya Inoue is fighting a Thai fighter, Aran Deepan, um, defending his uh, WBA and IBF bantamweight belts. Also on this card, Puerto Rico's Wilfredo Mendez defending his WBO uh, strawweight title against Masataka Taniguchi. This fight card is not on American TV. I know a bunch of you guys have asked about that. Uh, ESPN plus didn't pick it up. I don't quite understand it. I don't quite understand how they couldn't get somebody to plug in remote to do English commentary. You don't have to have somebody over there to do the commentary. You could plug somebody in remote at any of the ESPN studios. You could even get one of these guys. A guy like me could do it from my home studio. They have that technology. So there really is no excuse. And top rank is involved in the Naoya Inouye business. So this is a blunder on their part in my Honest, humble opinion. Okay, uh, Phuket, Thailand. It looks like fuck it, but it's Phuket, Thailand. Knockout CP Freshmart. Love that name. One of the best names in boxing. Going up against Robert Paradero 
defending his WBA strawweight title. As I always say with the strawweight division, like 105, 108, 112, those divisions seriously need unification. There's just a ton of belts out there. When you weigh 100, when my wife is bigger than you and she's a petite woman, you got to have like three or four belts to get attention. And these guys just never unify belts. It's, it's really frustrating. All right, December uh, 17th, Friday, there's a couple of cards. So you guys got Tuesday action, although it's not televised, unfortunately. But Friday action, ESPN Plus here in the United States. And I will be covering this card for ringtv.com. So look for my recaps at ringtv.com. And of course, with my recaps, you're going to get the real. You're not going to get the spiel. You guys want the real, not the spiel, right? If you want the spiel, then you know the names to go to. But you wouldn't be watching my show if you want that bullshit. So check out my recaps at ringtv.com. From the Bell Center in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, top rank in GYM promotions, Artur Baturbiev going up against Marcus Brown, defending his unified light heavyweight championship. Of course, Baturbiev, 36 years old. Brown, 31 years old. Baturbiev, 16 and 0. Went pro in 2013. Brown fought in the 2012 Olympics. Went pro right around the same time. But Terbiev did, but he's 24 and one. He's got more fights. He's been more active. But Terbiev's career has been plagued with inactivity. When, if ever, is that going to catch up to him? Is this the fight where perhaps he's in there with a guy that has just enough intangibles to make him look old? to expose some chinks in the armor, the ring rust, the inactivity, the injuries. I don't know. I'll say this. A lot of people think this is going to be a second round knockout or something. That's not what I see. I see Brown posing some problems, at least early on for Baturbiev. A lot of people are forgetting. First of all, again, Brown is experienced. He has fought some top guys, but he's big, rangy. He's got long arms. Southpaw was in the Olympics, does have experience. They point to his loss to Jean Pascal. Well, here's the thing. Yes, Brown was beat up in that fight, dropped three times, a headbutt stopped it. The cards were close. It was 75, 74, three times for Pascal. So even with those three knockdowns, Pascal barely walked away with that win. Okay. So it's not as if this was a complete annihilation, it was competitive despite the knockdowns. John Pascal was juiced to the fucking gills in his recent fights. So I don't count that. I really don't. Now, maybe I'll be made to look stupid after saying all this. Wouldn't be the first time. Won't be the last. But I actually think Brown's going to give Beterbiev an interesting fight, at least in the first few rounds. Now, I expect the Russian to start chopping him down in the middle rounds and then to stop him in the second half of the fight. That's what I expect. Okay, but I expect Brown to be competitive and to put some leather on Baturbiev in the first few rounds and to be um, to pose more problems than I think a lot of fans believe he will. That's just my personal gut feel on this one. Also, in uh, Uzbekistan. On the zone, Matchroom Boxing and World of Boxing promotions going back to Uzbekistan, where Matchroom did a card earlier this year. And we got some prospects on this one. Israel Madrimov going up against Michael Soro, 154 pounds. And then 140-pound prospect Shakram Giasov going up against Christian Rafael Coria. And 168-pound prospect coming off a devastating loss to Gabriel Rosado. Bektamir Melokuziev going up against Sergei Ekimov. So, uh, you know, Beck the bully. People were super high on him. I was too, although it was all kind of one-way traffic in his fights. We didn't see him in there with a guy who could punch back. We saw what happened when he was in there with a guy who could punch back. Now we're going to see how he responds to his first career loss and a, and a heavy one at that. But I think this is a smart move that Matrim is making putting on these cards in Uzbekistan, Italy, you know, just different parts of the world on a global platform that's in over 100 countries that is the future of this business and that is the future of media in general, particularly sports media, uh, with a global sport like boxing anyway. Smart. It's not going to pay off right away, 
But 10 years down the line, this sort of thing I really believe is going to pay off. So that's Friday, guys. Now on Saturday, uh, Danier Yelonusioff, two-time Olympian, fighting in Kazakhstan for the first time. He's a welterweight prospect, uh, blue chip welterweight prospect, uh, originally from Kazakhstan, but hasn't fought over there. So he's kind of having a homecoming. And then K2 Promotions is putting on a card from the Ukraine. And I think ESPN Plus picked this one up. Don't quote me, but I believe I saw something where they picked this one up. But uh, there's two prospects to check out here. Um, heavyweight Vladislav Serenko and lightweight Dennis Baranchek. Both of these guys are undefeated. So um, there's a couple cards there overseas. And then here, well, let's go to England. Uh, zone from Manchester Arena in England. Uh, matchroom Boxing, Joseph Parker and Derek Chisora doing the rematch. Parker won the first bout in May by split decision. This fight, I think it's time for Parker to shit or get off the pot. Are you going to make another serious title run, dude? Are you going to challenge for a title and give us something to get interested in? Impose a real challenge for either Tyson Fury or uh, or Alexander Usyk? Are, or are you just going to be a guy? Because at this stage of their careers, Joseph Parker should beat Chisora in this rematch, and he should knock him out. That's what should happen. Parker is frustrating because he has a lot of great tools, really, really great tools and just intangibles you can't really teach that he brings to the heavyweight division. For a modern heavyweight, he does a lot of things really well. He just kind of has a sparring partner mentality and a guy who's just showing up to get a paycheck. Doesn't really seem to have the hunger and the drive to, uh, to be great. And I'd love to see him just bite down a little bit and show us something in this fight and make a statement against Chisora. That's what I'm hoping for. I don't know if we'll get that, but that's what I'm hoping for. Because on paper, you should win this fight and you should win it by emphatic knockout. Also on this card, Carlos Gungora. Remember him? He scored that uh, upset win last December. KO 12 win over Ali Akhmadov. Had a fight earlier this year. He's on this card again against Lerone Richards. Then here in the States, uh, San Antonio, Texas, Golden Boy Promotions on the zone. Gilberto Zerdo Ramirez going up against Unieski Gonzalez. This is a light heavyweight eliminator for the WBA light heavyweight title. So who has the WBA right now? I believe. Who, do, who has the WBA? Is it? It's not Bevel. Is it? Who the hell is the WBA? Maybe it is Bevel. So this, oh yeah, it is. It is. Okay. So Ramirez versus Gonzalez. This is actually a good matchup in terms of styles and everything else. I like this matchup. And the winner of this fight has to go up against Dimitri Bevel. So I think it's going to be Zerto. Gilberto, Gilberto Ramirez and Dimitri Bevel next spring. That's a great fight, man. That's a really, really great fight. So uh, this is going to lead to something. There's a build here. So I like this matchup a lot this Saturday. Also on this card, uh, women defending their belts. Sanicia Superbad Estrada defending her junior uh, flyweight belt. And Marlon Esparza defending her flyweight belt. And then from the Tampa, Florida, the boxing hotbed of the universe, most valuable promotions, Jake Paul's promotional company. On Showtime pay-per-view, it is the rematch between Jake Paul and and Tyron Woodley, eight rounds cruiserweight. Paul won the first bout in August by split decision. He should win this fight more clearly. Uh, and then also Amanda Serrano fighting in a non-title lightweight fight. And they promise the people at most valuable promotions that Serrano and Taylor can happen next year. We'll see. Do I need to break down that card? Do I need to preview that? Really? I'm not going to, guys. I, I think, you know. Why, why waste time on that bullshit, right? Let's just jump to the calls, man. Let's just jump to the calls. All right. All right, 678, you're on the show. What's going on? Hey, my man. Um, uh, about um, Javante David, and I must tell you, man, I bought the Davis Barrios fight, and, like, in the middle of the fight, I'm like, 
you you should not play it for this, you know. So I'm, <laughs> uh, you know, Javante. I wanted to see the knockout, and and after the fight, I just felt disgusted. I'm like, you you know, they picked this guy for him. That's what they've always been doing. And I and I said to myself, you know, I'm not gonna buy any more tank fights unless he's fighting any of the top fighters. I'm I'm tired of this and the the. Floyd Mayweather, the money team, Le- Le- Leonard Ellaby. I understand what they're doing, but I feel like they're taking me for a fool. And I'm like, I'm not going to spend a dime. So the past tank fight, I did not buy it, did not purchase it, because they're behaving as if they know more than me and they know what I want to see. But I'm not just casual, you know. I know the top fighters in the division. And them dispelling the other fighters like that, I, I just don't understand it. And then I come to hear earlier today that um, they they might not want to show the ticket sales because mm-hmm. um, they don't have to. And I think they were comparing it with, I don't know. I heard it on some YouTube channel that like other entities and stuff, they don't have to share ticket sales. But I'm saying... You are the guys that saying you're building a superstar, right? And ticket sales, showing the ticket sales, that's a part of the marketing strategy. You know, you watch Avengers, Endgame, any any blockbuster stuff you're watching or going to these days. Ticket sales are part of like the marketing thing. You know, oh, look what, how much we sold and stuff. I think they really dropped the bar, the ball hard on this one. So I'm kind of interested to see what they're gonna do next, and just, 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 just what they're gonna do. But just to follow up with you on that, and uh, one more thing I wanted to jump into was the Bivol fight. I know you sounded like you weren't that impressed with Bivol, but for me, honestly, that's what I was expecting. You know, um, mm. I don't see Bivol as a four puncher. And um, I see him as having respectable power in the division. Maybe he should be at 168 actually, but that's actually what I saw. A good technical fighter, having enough power to keep the guy at bay, but the guy still in the fight to pose danger. That's just what I thought about the Bevo fight. Yeah, I think Bevel fights yeah. down to the level of his opposition. I think that when he fights Zerto Ramirez next year, he'll step it up. I really do. I, I think that he has great skills, and I expect that to be a really good fight next year when it happens. Yeah, I, I think so as well. And to piggyback off the Bevel, with him having respectable power, I think looking at the situation with Devin Haney, you know, like, Clearly, won his last two fight, but talking to the fighters that fought him, they were like of the opinion, you know, the power is not really much there. And the good thing is that Devin Haney is still young, so he still could develop along the mm-hmm. way. But looking at someone like Bivol, that he's not a he's not a knockout artist, you know, but he has enough punching power that's respectable. And if you go into the ring looking like a clown, he'll knock you out. So Devin Haney needs to get to that place where he has respectable power and it shouldn't be too much to ask of him for this because you have Lomachenko. Lomachenko at 135, people claim that Lomachenko is fighting above his weight, you know, Mm -hmm. and Lomachenko is able to knock out top opposition and put them to the ground with the exception of Teofimo Lopez. So I think I think Devin Haney needs to work on that. I don't know if his team is working on it. I know he's concerned about it because he's asked the Norris and he's inquired about it. So that's just what I think, uh, my opinion on, on that. But that's all I have, Mike. Um, let listen to your show. All right. Thanks a lot, Dane. Have a good one, man. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll get right into these. We got a bunch of calls, guys. So we got to keep these short. Uh, it looks like Nacho. Nacho, what's going on, my man? Hey, Nacho, Mike. Can you... no, oh, nothing much. Yeah. Hey, what's up? Uh, just real quick. Um, honestly, out of all the fights you just said, because it's another 
crazy busy Saturday again, which is going to be nuts to try to follow. Um, the the one fight that I think is kind of sneakily under the radar that many people aren't talking about is that Madrimov versus Soro fight. I think that's going to be the really the really uh, good fight this weekend. Um, and then the uh, Gongora Richards fight might be good as well. But I'm really looking forward to that one between Madrimov and Soro because. Soro's no joke. I mean, he right. fought uh, Brian Castaño, and he's a real experienced Experience. guy. And, yeah. And uh, Madrimov, like, that's a huge step up for him to be taking on Soro already. So I'm definitely curious to see how this one goes between these two guys and see who kind of makes themselves into um, a top contender at 54, uh, you know, once uh, the whole dust settles with uh, – the rematch between Charlo and Castaño to see if one of these guys gets a shot at them or if they end up having to fight for vacant belts when one of them moves up. But I definitely want to see uh, what happens with that one. Um, just real quick, um, I saw somebody on the chat was talking about the uh, numbers for Tank. Like, at this point, I'm pretty convinced, Mike, that that thing flopped like a dead fish. It did. I mean, because if, uh, if TMT... If TMT really had sold like the way Canelo did, they would have been bragging about it already. Yeah. The fact that they haven't said anything over a week later, that just tells you that, yeah, that thing flopped and they're not going to say anything. Just like they have for all of uh, Tank Davis's previous fights where they've kept quiet about what the numbers really ended up being. So I, I don't expect them to, to say anything about about how bad that pay-per-view did. Um. And then just uh, on the fights this weekend, I mean, there's just so many to cover, but I'm just going to touch on the ones that I was, uh, like, really interested in. Loma looked great. I thought he he looked about as close to what he did prior to the T.O. fight. Um, I was just kind of disappointed, though, that he lacked that killer instinct once he really hurt Kome in the seventh. I mean, I get that you're trying to be, you know, a sportsman and, trying to not hurt the guy. But if you have a chance to put the guy away, you put the guy away. You don't give him a chance to recover and hang around. Like, he should have gone in there and he should have just taken him out and been done with it. And then I think that would have really sent a statement. But because he let him hang around and he went the distance, a lot of people are kind of bashing him for kind of having uh, taken his foot off the gas pedal, which, I mean, it was his fault. He should have taken him out and he didn't. But overall, he still put on a hell of a, of a performance. I think he's about as close to what we saw him prior to the Lopez fight that he's been in uh, since, that, since that loss. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely like to see him get Camboso. Yeah. Now the only question is, is that are they going to give Loma the shot or are they going to go and try to get Haney instead? Because I wouldn't be surprised if Camboso is like, nah, I'd rather face Haney instead of facing Loma next. I, I think uh, the then, opposite. I think the opposite because Lomachenko is going to bring a lot more money. So I, and I think they're going to look at Lomachenko as being more vulnerable because he's older and he already lost to Tio and they just beat Tio. So I expect, like, if if I if I was a betting man, Nacho, I would bet that we get uh, Cambosos and Lomachenko next year. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing it to be honest. I don't think. I don't think Loma's vulnerable at this point. I think he's right. proven that he's he's pretty, you know, he's pretty close to where he was prior to the loss. So if Camboso's in the same thing, he's vulnerable, oh, good luck. Yeah, I'd like to see what happens there. Um, and then the other uh, couple of ones that I... Connor Ben, I get that people are excited that he knocked out Chris Algieri, but let's pump the brakes here. He knocked out a dude who was 37 years old hadn't been very active and was not exactly a power puncher to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I think people need to kind of stop this talk of like, Oh, he belongs as a, you know, like a top 10 contender and he's ready to fight like anybody in that, in that realm. No, he's not. To me, he's still a prospect that needs more seasoning before you even think about putting, putting him in there against the guy uh, who's even like, I wouldn't even put him in there right now against Virgil Ortiz. Or no. Blue Tennis. I think both of those guys, those guys would smoke them. And they're, yeah, and those guys are, are quote unquote prospects themselves. So there's no way that he's on that level. So 
I hope that they keep keep him busy and keep developing him, but he ain't ready for that just yet. Uh, and then uh, the other um, the Jared Anderson, big baby. I don't know how much longer um, they're, they're going to uh, need to develop him, Mike, but that dude is looking like a serious threat. Mm-hmm. I think eventually, probably sometime next year, he's going to be a threat to somebody in the top five. Like that kid does not need a whole lot of more, a whole lot more development, in my opinion. I don't think he's that far away from being ready for a title shot, but I mean, we'll see. We'll see uh, how the whole thing shakes out with Fury and Usyk and Joshua and you know everybody else uh, because he he's not that far away. I think a couple more fights and I think he might be legit uh, ready for somebody in the top five to kind of state his. Uh, his name as a contender in the division for sure. And, um, and the last thing I, I wanted to bring up was the whole, um, what, what was it? Um, Oh, I mean, you guys have just been, uh, you know, trolling and it's been hilarious, but like, I mean, can we please, like, I hope ESPN realizes that we don't need to see, uh, Ali Walsh, like, come on. Like that guy has no business on TV. Like he just needs to get like you know put on the uh, on the ESPN Plus part of the of the card yep. and mm-hmm. just let the guy develop because he has no business on television. Like you could see it. Like he needs a lot of work and he doesn't need the pressure of being on television. But I mean, who knows? Top rank is the ones that develop careers and they develop stars. So I'll be curious to see how long they ride this gravy train before eventually it falls it falls off the rails because I think at some point it will. Yeah. I mean, I'm just not convinced that the kid's a real fighter. All right, Mike, that's my call. I'll, All right. I'll just uh, talk to you next week. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, man. All right. You know, guys, I just realized, I think uh, Mike here in the chat says no Loma versus Kome review. I think I completely skipped over that fight, yo. I didn't even talk about it. I'm so sorry, guys. I just, there was so much to get to. I talked about, the undercard and everything else. And I just completely skipped over it. So real quick, um, let me get my thoughts. Uh, Nacho hit on some stuff, but uh, Lomachenko unanimous decision win over Richard Comey dropped him in the seventh round. And it was a completely one-sided fight. So if you watched my preview and listened to it, then you guys heard me give my opinion that I said, bet the over. I said, there's a strong possibility and probability that it was going the distance possible late stoppage by Loma. But what I find interesting is there is, you know, the Lomachenko haters out in full effect um, bashing the fact that he didn't stop Richard Comey. And I guess now because Comey lost by knockout once, now every top fighter is supposed to knock him out. And that's that's just a stupid narrative. Um, Lomachenko isn't a big power puncher at lightweight. He's a natural featherweight. And I know it drives some people crazy. There's certain American boxing writers I saw this weekend talking about this. Uh, it drives me crazy when people say Loma's not a natural lightweight. He's been fighting at lightweight for blah, 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 years. Blah, blah. Did you guys consider Manny Pacquiao a natural welterweight? He bulked up to be a welterweight, right? Those guys were naturally larger than him, right? Pacquiao stopped getting all those knockouts when he moved to welterweight, right? He scored knockdowns, but he didn't score knockouts at welterweight, right? It's a similar situation with Lomachenko at lightweight. Um, and he's never been a huge power puncher anyway. That's not his style, per se. Uh, if he, if he does knock guys out, it, it's an accumulation or he's catching him with stuff they don't see, you know, that sort of thing or to the body, you know, whatever. But the narrative that he was, you know, that he's a hype job, this, that, the other, because they didn't knock out Richard Comey. That's just really stupid. Richard Comey lost by knockout once to one of the most explosive punchers in the lower divisions when he's on his a game. And that's Teofimo Lopez, the same Teofimo Lopez that, you know, was getting the, the the breaks beat off him against Cambosis, but still dropped him late in that fight. The guy's an explosive puncher. And Lomachenko doesn't fight like that. He's not an explosive puncher. I thought that he performed well in this fight. Pretty much went the way I thought it would go. Uh, maybe even more one-sided than I thought it would go. I will say this. Lomachenko is probably, look, in terms of ratings, okay, in terms of ratings, Cambosos is the lightweight champion of the world. But in terms of who might be the best lightweight in the world today, right now, December 2021, it might be Lomachenko. It might be. 
It might be Cambosis. I don't know. But I want to see the two of them fight. Lopez is going to 140. So in my opinion, he's really not a part of this discussion. Tank Davis is not interested in fighting anybody with a pulse. So he's not a part of this discussion. I don't really give a shit about anything he does until he fights someone. So there's three names in this discussion. It's George Cambosos Jr., it's Devin Haney, it's Vasily Lomachenko. Devin Haney isn't yet on the level of a Lomachenko or even a Cambosos. Uh, good quality win against Linares, good quality win against Diaz. But he struggled at times in those wins. He's still developing. And I think it'd be smart for him and his team to get a couple more fights like that and wait this thing out. And I think it'd be smarter for a Cambosos because he has the option to fight Loma. Because even if you lose that fight, you lose to Loma. So I think it, I really, really do think it's very likely that somewhere in the first half of 2022, we see Lomachenko go over to Australia and fight Cambosos over there for the undisputed lightweight championship. And then I just go full circle back to Devin Haney here. Okay. Assuming Lomachenko wins, okay, and it's an assumption because Cambosos might, um, you still have Haney with that one title. And the powers that be in Haney's team who are doing the slow build over there, you know, now you're talking late 2022, maybe even early 2023, if he could still make 135, at that point, a fight between Lomachenko and Haney is a big fight. And you do that in Vegas. Uh, you could do it in New York or something like that, but Vegas, get the casino buy-in and, uh, you know, top ranks headquartered right there. It makes sense. And then you get for the, you know, undisputed, undisputed lightweight championship, right? That that would be the way I, I see that thing playing out. So we'll see what happens, but that's the way I see it playing out. By the way, Richard Comey, classy as hell in defeat. He is one of my favorite guys in boxing because He's just a class individual and will literally fight anybody. Look at his resume and the guys he's fought. Win some, lose some. But he's fought some good names, and he deserves respect. Put some respect on Richard Comey's name. All right, back to the phones. We got to keep these short, guys. We got a million calls here. Uh, okay, 570. Hey, I think this is Thad. What's going on, man? Yeah, boy, Mike, you're right on the money with that. Uh Lomachenko and, and Comey. I was worried about Comey. I was really mad at Lomachenko for not pressing and getting him out of there because guy gets hurt when he takes a beating prolonged. And uh, for him to put the foot on the gas, it's noble of him. Uh, it, to take off the gas is noble, but it, it's damaging in the long run. And mm. Comey was, I mean, he stumbled without even being touched. And he was out on his feet. Um, I just think it's a bad look for Loma uh, to not have gone in for the kill. And Comey, you're right, a uh, classy guy. Um, I didn't want to see him get hurt. And I was watching in the casino, and, and everybody kind of felt the same way. And then, you know, it was kind of a buzzkill after that. Loma stopped yeah. throwing with bad intentions, and the fight just went to decision. So he has no one to blame but himself on that. And uh, I say that's significant because, number one, like you said, Loma's a small, lightweight. And all these people making these excuses saying he's not is crazy. And you can see the, the size difference. Comey was larger in thickness and he was larger in height and he's about 155 pounds fight night Loma's probably about a, a buck 40 yeah so there's that significant weight difference and it's hard to knock guys out that way so when you have a guy hurt you go for it second of all i think it hurts lomachenko now because i don't think he's going to get the fight with kembosis i think kembosis is pushing for a fight with haney that way it's on the zone it's two the zone fighters and eddie hearn gets his wish he wants unification with haney and then they're going to move him up to 40. Haney's not going to fight Lomachenko. I'm telling you right now at 135, that fight's never going to happen. They're, they're not going to fight Loma. It's a stone cold loss and they know it. So they want to unify and move to 40 and then they could take their chances there. Cause Haney's a big boy at lightweight. He's about a yeah, buck 60 he when is. he goes into the ring. Yeah. Yeah. So it, we got to hope beyond hope that Bob pulls a miracle and makes that fight with Cambosis where Lomachenko either unifies or, you know, he loses and, and that's it. But, you know, that's best for boxing because, you know, Loma's going to fight anybody at lightweight. If it gets in the hands of Haney, he's going to freeze the belts. 
and we're not going to have a, we're, we're not going to have a, anything to look forward to. So with that, uh, moving on to Floyd, you had a question like why he's like ranting all of a sudden. It's, it's good knowledge um, that a lot of people have been saying that Floyd's budget may have been cut due to Canelo fighting on Showtime. They invested a large mm. portion of money to buy that fight because it's not a Fox mm. fight. And Floyd had a relationship with Showtime, not Fox. So money, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not like water, okay? There's a limit. So Showtime's budget now affects Floyd. And Floyd doesn't, it, they, they're coming out and saying they're not going to pay for fighters to fight tank. They're going to keep this charade up and make a little profit here and there. They're not going to, they don't have the money to offer another fighter to fight tank. So it, it is what it is. And, you know, if a fighter calls their bluff like Loma, if he says, yeah, I'll fight tank for the same amount of money that the last guy got, that would be the right strategy. You know, if, if you're looking, you know, to expose the Mayweather team, because they like to call themselves money, but they, they look like penthouse poppers to me at this point. <laughs> So I think I think that's significant. And hey, Mike, are you going to go to the um, January fifteenth fight at the Turning Stone Casino in Verona, New York, where Joe Smith is defending his title against Callum Callum Johnson? I don't know who's doing that one. Yet. To, I'm not sure, but that, that would be one I would be interested in checking right. out. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Put in your request for that because that's going to be fight of the year. I'm going. Um, you know, a lot of people are going to be there, and I mean that's going to be fight of the year. That's what I'm looking forward to. And, and the lead up to light heavyweight, that's going to be the hottest division this year. Like you said, there's, there's a lot of fights cooking up. You got people who, let me just say, he is like the, the Eastern European Floyd Mayweather. And I, I say that kind of as a detriment because he fights in one gear all fight. He dominates, but he doesn't step it up. That's a problem. Someone's got to get in his ear and say, hey, you got to, you got to upshift to fourth, fifth, sixth gear and get some of these guys out of there because it's boring as hell and you're a better fighter than that. And he's, he's just content to coast and, and it's not good for the fans. But if he fights Zerto, he's going to have to do that. He's going to have yeah. to step it up. Absolutely. I think Zerto's going to force him to. If he wins, well, hopefully. Because then, yeah, maybe that's what he's missing. He needs that guy. Because yep. Joe Smith, I mean, he toyed with Smith up until the last round where Smith just clocked him, almost knocked him out. Right. And, and I give Bevel credit for taking that shot, and he came back and he won the fight without question. But now you have Joe Smith on the upswing. If he gets by Johnson, like I think he's going to do, you have Baturbi of this weekend against Brown. Like you said, that's going to be a firefight. That's going to be an exciting fight. I'm looking forward to it. I think Baturbi have stopped him late. I think it's competitive. And then you're going to have sort of like a, a round robin of unification. You may have the uh, Smith versus Baturbi fight. You might have uh, Bevel versus, um, you know, the next best light heavyweight. And then you have Canelo waiting in the wings. So I think that's for the boxing fans. We might have, you know, a really nice round Robin, you know, to, to look forward to there. So, you know, I really hope that, you know, this, this goes forward because Baturbiev, all that potential, it was wasted with all this non-fighting. And he's a vulnerable guy now. He's 36 and he's slowing down. I think he gets tagged by Brown, but I think, you know, he's just too powerful for too a guy strong. like Brown because Brown doesn't have a great chin. If you, you yeah. remember when he fought Hot Rod Kalajdik, Kalajdik, you know, messed him up pretty good. And But Brown got the decision he didn't deserve. So it's going to be an action-packed fight. And uh, all these light heavyweight fights are really, really action-packed potential. So... Would love to see Ring Magazine do a little, um, you know, propo, whatever you want to call it, on the light heavyweight division because I think there's mm. a, a watershed moment for the boxing fans. It's a good idea. So, you know, with that, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, a lot of coverage there because these big guys, they're just not getting the credit they deserve. We saw a little promotion with Tyson Fury and, and Usyk where the crowd went nuts for Usyk, but then they took the camera off Usyk. It was kind of weird. I thought that maybe Top Rank was uh, playing games there. When they showed him on the TV, and then they pulled away, he was getting ready to stand up, and then all of a sudden you hear an uproar in the background. But they took the camera off Usyk. So, I don't know. Maybe there's just some gamesmanship there, because he's a DAZN fighter. And uh, I think, 
you know, with this boxing cold war, with all these promotions and, you know, whose fighter is, you know, going to fight on whose platform. And, you know, we got to get away from that. Boxing has got to have, you know, a come to God moment. Um, you know, cause we're, you know, the fans, they're just not paying for fights as you could see with Tank Davis. I mean, it was a, a huge flop. So Mike, uh, with that, you know, maybe here's some comments about uh, what you think and, uh, you know, hope that you get tickets to that fight. Cause trust me, that's going to be the one. All right, man. Cool. All right, dad. Thanks a lot, man. Have a good one. You too. Good stuff from dad. As always, we're gonna keep it rolling guys. And then keep right back into these calls. Yeah. I think, um, light heavyweight had a down 2020, 2021. And next year it's set up to have a resurgence and it's up to the players involved to make it happen. But uh, I'm with that. I think that that Joe Smith fight is going to be fire. And I think this one between Baturbiev and Brown, that's going to be fire too. And if we get these guys fighting each other next year, we get Zerto fighting uh, Bevel and he forces Bevel to fight and dig down. I think we're going to have that, that division will be red hot again because the, the, the fighters at the very top, it's not a crazy loaded division, but at the very top, the top five or so guys are all good. They all fight each other. It'll take care of itself. You know, it'll be real. It'll be basically what I think we could be having at lightweight over the next couple of years. Sands Tank Davis because he wants no part of it. Okay, let's get back to the foes. 818, what's going on? You're on the show. Hey, Mike. Uh, it's Mike as well. Um, I wanted to ask a question regarding the 135 division. Um, so I heard a couple times people were saying about, um, you know, Cambosis, you know, he gets his choosing, he gets his picking. But I wanted to know, it's only going to be one question, by the way. I wanted to know, um, in your mind, I know you said he was going to choose Lomachenko, but I mean, I personally think it's going to be whoever offers the most money. Emotional wise, I could see um, Eddie Hearn probably putting up the most money because he wants that unification with Haney. But, mm. you know, the Lomachenko fight is very lucrative. So um, I just wanted your opinion on that. Um, in your mind, who do you think Kim Bose is going to get? But, uh, that's all my question. Just one question. Two minutes quick. So thanks, I uh, think thanks for letting me on your show. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bring up a great point. Um, money will talk. And there, there is a little uh, a rivalry between Grandpa Bob and, and Cousin Eddie. And uh, they, <laughs> Grandpa Bob does not like Eddie Hearn. And the, the one thing, I don't know how much money Grandpa Bob is going to be willing to put up for that fight against Cambosis. We know Eddie will overpay. We know he'll come out of his pocket and perhaps overpay to get that fight. And in the end, money might talk. I think that the prestige of fighting Lomachenko, it, it just, it's just a gut feel I have. I don't have any inside information or anything like that. It's just a gut feel I have. I think that's ultimately going to win out. And I see Lomachenko and Cambosis fighting, but um, perhaps, you know, Hey, if, if, if Eddie Hearn puts up two, three million more dollars, Cambosis will be stupid to say no to that, to fight Devin Haney. So that's a really good point that I hadn't considered. Right, yeah, I I agree. Um, but again, that was just my question. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate the time, and uh, thank you for uh, putting on a great show. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. Have a good night. Okay, we keep it going. We have nine three six. You're on the show. What's going on? Oh, hi, Mike. This is Brad from Texas. So, I uh, I don't know if you guys heard. But uh, Muhammad Ali's grandson was on ESPN <laughs> this weekend. I know, man. Crazy, right? I didn't know he had a grandson. Oh, my God. Right. Andy boxes? Oh, my God. I got to see this. It's amazing. Holy shit. Right. You know, you know, we, we, we laugh, though. My parents heard that. They turned they tuned in. Oh, oh hey. There you go. So, see? Yeah. See? We don't know what we're talking about, Brad. That's, yeah, that, that's who the demographic is, is people in their 60s. There you go. Uh, about... I, uh, I've been meaning to call you since TFEMO lost, and this has been one of the most interesting months in the lightweight division that I can remember. Uh, yeah. You were talking before about how they need to get TFEMO away from his dad. 
I think Tiafimo is every bit as crazy as his father. His father just doesn't hide it as well. Mm. Um, I could see that. I I would really love to see. I would really love to see Lomachenko fight uh, Cambosis. I would I would love to see them completely unify that division. Even though the WBC ought to be Loma's anyway, or the Cambosis now anyway. Uh, I'm I'm just going to leave you with this: Who is mismanaging their career worse, Tiafimo or Tank? Tiafimo. Shut up and listen. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brad. I, Thank um, you. I think um, I would have to say at this point, first of all, Tank Davis doesn't manage his own career. It's 100% in the hands of Mayweather, LRB, and uh, Al Heyman. They com- he has zero say, honestly. Um, they He's just given up all control. Tio Jr., just the way the the entire thing was handled with Cambosos was just, it was so poorly mismanaged from start to finish. This entire year was a massive dis- disaster for Lopez. So I would say that they've actually mismanaged their career more. Now, long term, five, 10 years from now, I don't know. It, it might, it might flip because if Davis keeps fighting the guys he's fighting, if he finally does get in there against a top guy in their prime who can punch, it really could come back and cost him. Um, I don't think they're ever going to do that. I think that what they're going to do is try to wait out Lomachenko and fight him when he's like 40 or, you know, they'll do those sorts of moves. But um, the, the biggest difference is Davis has fought nobody and has made just as much, if not more money than Teofimo Lopez has. So in that respect, from a business management point of view, they've done better for Davis than uh, Lopez, you know, his people have done for him. It's not on top rank. If he just would have followed top rank's program, he'd be fine. But yeah, I would, I would give that one to uh, Tank Davis. I hate to say it, but it is what it is. Okay, back to the phones we go. Uh, I think this is Rich. You're on the show. What's going on? Hey, Mike, how you doing? Good, man. How are you? Hey, I'm good, man. Good. I just um, want to get a couple of my thoughts in um, regarding, well, with the hot topic, the uh, lightweight division. Uh, the way the way I look at it is, I, obviously, uh, George Cambosos is the um, lineal champion for, you know, for beating the man, which is Tia Fimo. And with Tia Fimo playing the move up to 140, I, based on the last few, the so, so most recent lightweight fights that we've seen, which you know they're all we're all pretty good fights. Um, Lomachenko is the number one uh, lightweight division, in my opinion, because um, you know yeah, I know a lot of people might be been upset that he didn't um, stop Richard Comey over the weekend, but the way he dominated him says a lot still. And in the mm-hmm. way um, when he, the way he defeated Nakatani over the summer, he, he's showing that you know. He, he that he's you know he still has all you know the skills and the abilities to beat top uh, elite fighters and me personally I I think um, had they done a rematch with him and Teofimo I mean he had a really good shot of winning that rematch I don't, I don't think we're going to see that rematch anymore uh, with that being said I would like to definitely see a Lomachenko and Kambosa fight and I think like you know, a fight in Australia would, would be huge um, and I I think. I think Lomachenko actually beats uh, Tank Davis too, as well. If they were to ever fight each other, um, you know, Tank, Tank's explosive, uh, you know, he's powerful, but um, I think I would like to see a fight maybe between Tank and Devon Haney. I think that would be a pretty interesting matchup because uh, boxing skills, I, I see Haney still the better um, skillful boxer than, than Tank, but Tank has that power. And you catch the well, Haney's chin, I think it's kind of suspect. So, you right. know, that he could, Tank could turn around with a bunch of knockout Haney. So, I could definitely see that. So, those are kind of like the matchups I would like to see. I would like to see a Haney take Davis fight and then come both with Lomachenko. And then, you know, the, the winners could face off with each other. And I, I think that would be uh, a good matchup. And then I think another good matchup, a lightweight, would be Joseph Diaz and Isaac Cruz. I think that I would love be that. A, uh, yeah. Fight. Yeah, I think that would be a good matchup because they both lost their recent fights, but they put good efforts. And um, I just want to touch up on that Cruz 
uh, Tank Davis fight, um, you mentioned it already. I and I put my I had my input that the commentary team was so biased in that fight. I mean, they anytime Tank threw an uppercut, they say it landed, but it really didn't land. Yeah. You know? And then when they put the replays back on that, it showed it didn't land, and they just kind of stayed quiet once they looked at it. <laughs> yeah, and Al Bernstein got really mad at me for that. But he got mad at me because he knows oh, that I was okay. right. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's true. I mean, they were they were just like uh, you know cheerleaders for Tank, and you know I understand, but it's a lot of those shots didn't land. The, they didn't land a lot of those, uh, those um, uppercuts that Tank you know, yep. threw. They didn't land. A lot of it was kind of blocked. And I think what's maybe the the height of Cruz and the way he had his guard up was he was able to um, you know block those shots. Even at the end of the fight, and this face looked pretty damn clean at the end. Yep. It was like he didn't get hit at all yep. in that fight. So, Cruz showed something. It doesn't surprise me that, um, you know, I, I think it was expected for Tank to get a knockout against Cruz, but it doesn't surprise me that he did it. Why? Because, to be honest with you, as a lightweight Tank, I'm talking about 135, not 130, not 140, Cruz was Tank's toughest test at 135. That's that's the truth, okay? I mean, Cruz, I mean, I, if I'm i looking by ring ratings, and that's the ratings I, I go by. Um, I mean, it has, I think he's ranked number nine or eight by Ring Magazine, um, Isaac Cruz. And prior to that, I mean, he fought what? Uh, uh, blown up, washed up Gamboa. That doesn't, that doesn't really count, you know what I mean, like, yep. for, for me. So... In my opinion, it was Tank's toughest test, and if he didn't get the knockout, it's because maybe you know Cruz is just better than what people thought he was. You know what I mean? He it was an eye opener for people, and now people saw how good Cruz was, and then you know it just it just it just showed in the fight. So you know he just uh, blocked a lot of shots, and he had a you know pretty good chin. So that's just kind of my uh, analysis on that, and um, just want to give a. Just want to say that Nonito Nonito Donier is the man at um, what he's doing at this at this age. Really impressed. The fact that he's 39 years old, going strong, and still an elite fighter. If I'm looking at the vision, I honestly I think he beats every guy in the vision with the exception of Inouye. Mm. You know, and I would still love to see that that rematch. Um, I still think if they were to fight, I think Inouye would would be in the rematch. But I still think Nonito would still give him a, a pretty good fight. Agreed. But this kind of reminds me of the, the the days of like um, you know, like having this, this second run at an older age. Kind of reminds me of like when Azuma Nelson was doing this. You know, uh, you know, I think it was around his late thirties. He became world champion and was doing a thing at the uh, one thirty. Or you know, Daniel Saragossa going back to one twenty two. He was kind of like a second run. Kind of remind me of those those uh, those days with those guys Throwbacks, kind of do it at an man. older age. Kind of have a sec- yeah, kind of like a sec like a second run at it. If you look yeah. at it, they had a second run in their late thirties, and and they were in a smaller weight division too. So, um, and uh, real quick, at some point, I kind of felt that ESPN is was, they're dropping the ball with anyway as he's fighting he's fighting tomorrow. Yep. Doesn't matter if he's having a showcase fight or a tuna fight. That, that's something that should have been televised here in the states. A hundred percent, man. And yeah, and, and I know, I know they have the other, uh, the Puerto Rican champion of the minimum weight or star weight division, whatever you want to call it, Roberto Mendes. But you know, sometimes they have to showcase some of these guys. So you, you, people get to kind of see them, kind of like, hey, you know, like we saw, you know, Camito Lopez or Ivan Calderon at star weight. They were doing their thing, but. They were televised here in the States, so they're, you know, or I mean, I know they were fighting the States, but they're televised. People get to see who these smaller guys in the, in the smaller weight divisions are, who are, who are the world champions. But fortunately, we don't get to see that in, at times. And I know, I know, like some guys like Mendes or like some of those guys from Thailand just kind of fire the country, so it's kind of hard to, to see that. Um, but yeah, I don't want to keep you, keep you on there this long. I just want to give my couple feedback on the little points there. All right, Rich. Thanks a lot, man. Good stuff, bro. Oh, Good hearing one, from Mike, you. Real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quick, so I, want, I want to get your quick opinion on this. What do you think on the next month's fight between Keith Thurman and Mario Barrios? I'm going to throw it out there. It's it's not a bad matchup, although Barrios, you know, coming off yeah. a, a loss and then moving up 
Uh, he, he got knocked out by a lightweight, and now he's moving up to fight a welterweight. But it, it, it's not really a terrible matchup. But on pay per view, dude, you got to be shitting me. If this was a co feature on well, like a Fox yeah, yeah. card, yeah. I think it'd be great. But pay per view, yeah. nah. That's what I think. Well, no, I think I think everybody knows that it it should have belonged on pay per view. But um, no, I think it, I think it's an interesting fight too. Yeah, I think he, you know it's interesting because Thurman's has been off too long. He Thurman's been off too long. Yeah. So I mean, we, we never we don't know like he he, I, he took a long layoff and fought uh, was it was it Cito Lopez and I remember he didn't look that good in that fight either. So he hasn't looked know. good in a long time, man. <laughs> But I think when Mario no, Barrios know. made the deal to fight Javante Davis, part of the deal on the back end is, hey, you're going to take an L here, but we're going to take care of you. And this is that taken care of. He's going to get paid again well here. They're going to cash out on Thurman. Yeah. Uh, don't be surprised if Barrios somehow wins this that fight. It sounds crazy, but um, it doesn't belong no, on pay-per-view. No, actually, yeah. no, it doesn't belong on pay-per-view, but I wouldn't be surprised either because I think a lot of these guys uh, have good skills. Another guy I think that's fighting in February, uh, Gary Russell Jr. Yep. I think he's going to fight. Uh, mm -hmm. with the, with, I don't be surprised if any of these guys lose because they just take so much time off. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think these are the type of guys that need to stay active to have their skills. They have to uh, sharpen their skills and stay active, but they don't. And they take too much time off. So, you know, don't be surprised that these guys get upset coming up. You know what I mean? Keith Thurman or even Gary Russell in February. So. I hear you, man. I just want to throw that out there. So. All right, bro. We're going to get on right, to the Mike. next one. You got it, brother. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot, man. Call, man. Appreciate Peace. it. Okay. Bye. Yeah. And, and to, to Rich's point, I think the inactivity is going to affect Thurman more than Russell because Russell's so used to it. It's what he's, what he's always done. So uh, Russell, you know, still might be the best featherweight in the world. It's just, you know, he fights once a year and everything. That He's fine doing that. He, he's able to to pull it off. The only guy he wasn't able to beat is Lomachenko. There's no shame in that, losing to Lomachenko at his best weight. Um, but Thurman, I just, I feel like they're cashing that dude out. He, he could ice Barrios, you know, because of the size difference. But Barrios could, like, tough out and work, like, outwork him. Uh, just kind of, like, gut out a decision win in that fight. I still can't believe that shit's on pay-per-view, man. That's bananas. All right, let's go to Isan. Isan, what's up, man? How you doing? What's going on? What's going on? Doing pretty good, man. I was gonna um I was gonna chime in on the stuff about Bevo. I, I, I would do what you're saying, like fight down. Yo, man, I can I can barely hear you. You're real quiet. Are you like standing away from your phone? No, uh let me see if I'm I'm in my car, so I should be uh maybe it's through the can you hear me now? I can hear you. It's just really. Can you guys on the chat hear him? Go ahead, dude. Go ahead. I just. Um, it sounds low. Okay. Um. I'll try to get closer. But um. Yeah, I was gonna say that like Bevo fights down to a level of his opposition. Yeah. Kind of just like molds it out and just keeps it safe, and he doesn't really stay in the pocket much. But I think when you get a guy in there that's gonna come at him like Zerto, he's gonna be much more aggressive and move a lot more. Because in the Joe Smith Jr. fight, he he outclassed him, but he was like throwing a lot of punches still and when you had in like earlier in his career because he has a pretty good resume for his amount of fights he fought a lot of top like heavyweights yeah yeah like, absolutely. So in the past when like he was facing when he was facing better out competition you saw him getting more knockouts and his fights were much more exciting against those top guys but lately his competition has heavily died down so you know i don't really expect much of it when he's not facing a guy that's gonna stand a chance but I think with Zerto, that's going to be a great fight. I can't wait for that. People are saying he's ducking him because he turned down an offer. I'm like, they're going to fight next. They're going to fight next. Absolutely. They're, they're going to fight next year. And I'm with you, man. I think, I think Zerto is going to force Bevel to step up a little bit, and you're going to see more skills. And that's a fun fight, dude. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it definitely is. I think I haven't thought – about it too much. I need to watch more of Zerto's fights, like his last 10 fights, something like that, to get an idea of how it goes. But I think, from what I've seen so far, I feel like Bevo's seen more of Zerto than Zerto's seen of him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like a guy that's going to come, like a lot of his points come at him heavy, you know, a lot of offense, but he kind of just is always able to keep away on his back foot and still win rounds. But I was going to say, too, with the Lomachenko stuff, yeah, I think he's getting the fight next. I remember I was talking to you after the fight, 
uh, after Cambosos won the titles, and I was saying, like, I think that's going to get ordered next because the WBO has been waiting around for, like, two years, giving exemptions, and you already know how Bob is with Paco. Yeah. That's why I think it's going to happen. That's another thing. Yeah, you, that's a, thank you for bringing that up because I completely forgot to bring that up. We're Bob's organization. Uh, Bob's going to work it out to where <laughs> they got to fight. They got their mandatory is going to be Loma or something like that. And th- I'm, I'm telling you, I just have a gut feel. That's the fight we're going to get. It's Cambosos and Lomachenko. And I like it. I like that fight. Yeah, I do too. It's going to be fun. It's going to be in Australia. Yep. Big event. I, I'm, I'm happy about it, you know. As long as the winner fight Tammy, I'm cool with everything. I, as long as the winner fight Tammy, yeah. just get all that shit straightened out already. No more of this franchise shit. Get it over with. Because if Loma gets the belt, the division will be stable again. You see with Tio, he has one mandatory. It takes a whole year to get it done, then he loses. When Loma had the belt, there was never just any issues, I swear. When do you think if, if, if Loma beats Cambosos, do you think we would get a fight between Loma and Haney? Do you think it could happen? I think it could, yeah. I think okay. I think it could. Only but certain things certain things have to happen. It's like one, like let's say if they I was gonna say because I know the zone trying to do pay per views, but it's only in the UK. So I was thinking like, hey, if they do pay per views, maybe they can do it as a joint thing, but no. I mean, if, if top rank can, you know, offer Devin something good, they can get that fight going, you know. Yeah. Or Loma, he could just um, he could just make it happen through his WBC franchise status, make Devin his mandatory. Because that's what Tio was going to do after. If he, had, if he had beaten George, I forgot what I saw, but his dad or whatever, they were petitioning the WBC to have uh, become Devin's mandatory. That's what they were going to do next. I, saw, I was reading up mm. about it. So Loma could do that same thing. Obviously, he lost, so he didn't fall through with it. But still, Loma could do that and become a mandatory for the person. Yeah, I, I think because I know if, if Cambosos beats Lomachenko, then obviously the fight with Haney is going to happen because they're both the zone match room. That will definitely happen. I just wonder about oh, yeah. Loma and Haney. Like you know, I'd be worried about that. Maybe you know, not happening, but. Um, a lot has to take place before we can even ask that question, you know. Yeah, that's 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 why I don't think about it too much because we're 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 at least a few fights away from that. At least for like that, what Haney's going to be doing. But, and Haney might go yeah, to one forty by then. He might say "fuck this" I'm, and go to yeah. one forty. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I was just about to say that. For all we know, Haney could. Cause I was going to say because let's say if Loma beats Cambosis and there's issues with getting that WBC belt, I mean. Like I said, he can literally become his mandatory, but if something happens where that doesn't happen, he can just wait around and eventually Devin's going to move up and that belt's going to be vacant and he can just petition to be. He can do what he did with Luke Campbell with that and boom. Yeah. Because Devin won't be there as long as Lomachenko, that's for sure. I hear you, man. I hear you. Yeah, that's all I got to say, though, Mike. Have a good night, man. All right, brother. You too, man. Good to hear from you. All right, take care. All right, a couple things here in the chat. James Hunt, who's been going hard at Loma, uh, says if 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 Loma didn't fight Haney when he was his mandatory, it never will. James, I've se- I've seen some of your comments in the chat today about this. I got to correct you on a few things because you have your timeline shaken up. Okay, Devin Haney won his interim belt. I want to say like a month or something before Lomachenko was elevated to WBC franchise and all that. And whether you believe that. Lomachenko or top rank, I should say, requested to have that franchise title or all that or not. It's really irrelevant. The bottom line is this. Everybody in the boxing industry knew for a year before Haney even won his interim belt that top rank Bob Arum wanted to do a fight between Lomachenko and Teofimo Lopez, right? Teofimo Lopez was far more proven than Devin Haney at that point. Devin Haney and his people, his management, knew that Lomachenko was going to fight um, Lopez. Everybody knew that. Now, that fight got delayed, and there were issues because of all the stuff going on in the world. I'm not going to go into all that. You already know the story there. But ultimately, you have a year to fulfill your mandatory obligation, okay, if you have a mandatory. And it was clear that Loma wanted to go forward and fight uh, Lopez, the WBC knew that everybody involved knew that 
The whole franchise thing was so that the WBC could save face and they could say, hey, we're in the Devin Haney business, but we're going to stay in the Lomachenko business because we want to be a part of this undisputed thing. So we're going to get sanctioning fees on both ends. To act as if Vasily Lomachenko and his team ducked a guy that had been there mandatory for like three weeks to fight a better fighter who is far more proven and with the same promotional company, fought on the same network. Everybody knew they were going to fight for about a year before it happened. That's crazy, dude. You got to stop with that. And that, so, so if anything, it was smooth business procedure on Devin Haney's team to be able to publicly on Twitter say, hey, they don't want none. But I got to tell you, brother, from the inside sources I have, from the people close, close to that camp that I've talked to, it was Devin Haney and his team that don't want a motherfucking thing to do with Lomachenko. That's what I've heard. Tank Davis and them don't want a damn piece of Lomachenko either. And you already know that because that, you know, Floyd's made that public. But you got to chill with that narrative, dude. Okay. Trust me on this. Lomachenko wasn't ducking nobody. This is a guy who fought Orlando Salido in his second pro fight. This is a guy who fought Gary Russell Jr. in his third pro fight. And you're telling me that they were ducking a prospect, Devin Haney? Chill the fuck out with that shit, bro. Chill, chill with that shit, homie. All right. Don't let your hate supersede your logic and reason. Super chat pledge from Komat Suda. Thank you so much from New Zealand. He says, uh, in your opinion, is boxing the most corrupt sport? That's a good question. Um, and you, you're, you might not like my answer because the easy answer would, for, would be for me to say yes and go on a Teddy Atlas rant, right? Because that's what Teddy would do, right? <clears throat> no, it's not. It's got Tons of issues, okay? But the most corrupt sporting organization on earth is the International Olympic Committee, okay? Which literally uses slave labor in third world countries to build these stadiums that get used once and then are left vacant in these third world countries with, you know, led by dictators where they put up their events. It is unbelievably corrupt, the IOC. It is the most corrupt sporting organization on earth. Second to that is probably FIFA, okay? Unbelievably corrupt. Organized crime in many different, many different types of organized crime run FIFA and also the IOC. So boxing is involved with the IOC through the AIBA, which is corrupt, okay? Um, so that's like a wing because there's, you know, boxing is an Olympic sport. But look no further than those two sporting entities, which are massive global organizations, right? Um, and look at what they do. The more I learn about the Olympics, the more I want no part of it. Uh, when you look at just the, the way that they conduct their business, while the executives at the IOC are put up in these like five-star hotels, they're treated like gods, seriously. And I'm not joking when I say slave labor builds these stadiums that they house these Olympic games at. It's documented that that's literally what happens, whether it's in China, Russia, wherever the games are, they bring in slave labor from other countries and force these people to work, to build these stadiums that sit vacant. Remember the Sochi games in Russia, all those stadiums and stuff, but they're just sitting there empty. No one uses them. It's, there's a ton of shit in China just like that. So um, yeah, dude, boxing has a lot of issues. Okay. A lot of issues, but there are far more corrupt sports, trust me. Not to say boxing doesn't have problems, because holy shit, do we. Okay, one last call. Let's do one last call, all right? We're going to go to Seattle. Rainy, chilly Seattle. Someone's throwing a fish in that market. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, 206, you're on the show. What's up, man? What's up, Mike? Uh, DJ from Washington. How you doing? Good, man. How are you, DJ? I'm doing all right. You kind of summarized it right there. It's pretty chilly and rainy outside out here. Not too good. That's all I know about Seattle, man. It's one of the few cities I've never been to because I've pretty much been to every major city in America, but I'd love to check out Seattle sometime. You hit, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I moved to the outskirts. Seattle's a little muddy, so I'm, I'm gotcha. out in the country right now. Um, yo, I, I was a little bit late, so I don't know if you already covered this, but um, Keyshawn Davis, it was a, a kind of a layup fight, but he looked really good. Yeah. And he's like a smart, charismatic kid on the mic. Just wondering how many times you think realistically top rank gets him in the ring next year. Four or five times. 
probably. I, I was there for his pro debut earlier this year. And right away, I was like, oh, shit, this kid's got something. Okay. And um, Top Rank sees it. They signed him and his brother. They got him working with Bud Crawford's team, uh, perfecting athletes. And those guys, you know, experts in nutrition and supplementation and all that. So he is in really, really good hands. And I wouldn't doubt that he fights four or five times next year. Yeah, I mean, he said he's ready to get pushed. So, I mean, I, I hope that's the case next yeah. year. He seems pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, last question, summarizing things. Um, so it seems like Top Rank's trying to insert Shakur Stevenson into Lomachenko. And I don't know, that's weird to me. Like, they obviously have the fight, like the fight right in front of them. It seems like there's a lot of hesitation to make Shakur versus Valdez. Do you think that's coming from Valdez's team behind doors? Or do you think yeah. Bob economically likes having two different entities at 130? Or what do you think's the hold up? I can tell you right now. Shakur wants to fight with Valdez. Valdez does not want to fight with Shakur. Uh, I think Shakur. That's kind of what it seems like. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Valdez does not want that fight. And with top rank, here's what top rank would love to do. Okay, top rank scenario here. They would love for Loma to fight Cambosis next year and beat him. Haney to vacate his belt and move up to 140. Shakur and Valdez to fight and consolidate things at 30, 130. Stevenson wins that fight, moves up to 35, fights Lobachenko for the undisputed lightweight championship. That's the plan top rank has in mind. That's how they'd love all this to play out. Yo, did you go away, DJ? Did I blow your mind? (laughs) Hello? Oh, the rainy Seattle weather must have cut DJ's call. He, He just disappeared on us. Um, well, damn, DJ. I was curious what you thought about that. Anyway, um, appreciate your call, man. Technology. Isn't it great, guys? All right. Um, I think I think that's it for today. Uh, actually, you guys, some of you are agree with my IOC stuff. Look, man, I, I got a lot of in, inside info on the IOC. I'm telling you, man, they are terrible. Terrible people, terrible people. Ban the Olympics. Taurine says IOC screwed over plenty of fighters. Roy, Floyd, Holyfield, Conlon, Joy. Oh, fuck yeah. Golovkin. Uh, but yeah, Floyd got screwed. Roy got screwed. Holyfield. Oh my God, did he get screwed? All those guys you mentioned. And technically it's Aiba, you know, but they're under the Olympic thing. And yeah, um, it, it's absolutely absolutely terrible that organization i'm just gonna leave it at that all right guys awesome show man i'll see you guys friday and then uh again next monday will be the last tnc of 2021 so let's make it a good one all right all right guys have a great week i'll see you at the fights peace